Today we'll, I wanted to do a few more problems from 7.2, just to make sure you're good with that topic. And we're getting a 7.3 and 7.4. Uh, you'll notice we're going to return in the binomial probability distributions. Remember with like the binome PDF and the binome CDF, so we're turning that. We're going to make a connection between binomial distributions and normal distributions, the bell-shaped curve. Um, if you recall, I remember in class, or even you made the observation, the binomial distribution, you notice it was bell-shaped. Mm -hmm. And so they do become bell-shaped at a certain point. <coughs> sample size and the actual uh, probability of the, uh, that the, for the success of that trial on the binomial probability distribution. So anyway, the problem we were doing last dealt with the gestation period. And this was the mean. It was 266 days was the mean for the population, that was the mean gestation period. The standard deviation was 16 days. And we just knew, all right, this is what the image looks like. You got a 266 in the middle. This is like an X. If I went one standard deviation over to the right, we realized you had 16 of that. It was 282. And uh, over here it was 250. But this is what the distribution was. Here's the x values. But we were doing everything with z scores. We were standardizing everything with z scores. And z equals 0 at 266, and z equals 1 at 282, and z equals negative 1 over here at 250, right? Is that one okay how I made that image? Just using these two numbers? And they said this was enough. The distribution was approximately normal. And so we're going to make this image. And we were answering a bunch of questions. So I wanted to do a couple more with this. Um, and this was from section 7-2. The problem we were doing was number 41. And it was on page 378. But I just wanted to continue with a few more questions. Did we get up to like a letter D? Mm -hmm. OK, so we'll call this one E. And we'll just do another one. What's the probability? This time I'll just put P with this statement. Oh, I should do a percentile right. I should do another percentile right. All right. <coughs> and what is the percentile right? I should definitely do another one of those. What's the percentile right? Well, the gestation period that lasts. Last time, do you recall the number I used? Five, I think. Way down here was a low 230. 200. 230? 230. All right, this time, everyone, I'm going to use 240. <laughs> that lasts 240 days. Right. So if you ever hear these words, <coughs> percentile rank, and it's dealing with a normal distribution, we did a three-step process every time to come up with the solution. And the first step, we always made a picture. Well, your picture one, you're going to be shading from the left side, always, for percentile rank, because you're accumulating from 0%. So almost like that word right there, percentile rank, you're like, that's how I'm going to shade my picture of my bill, no matter what. Always from the left for percentile rank. So percentile rank is always below. <laughs> that's right. Percentile rank is always below. Think less than, yeah. He's like, think, think. You can change the question. The less than 240 days, if you want. Every time you see percentile rank, you can change the wording. You can say, what's the probability that the gestation period lasts less than 240 days? You can absolutely do that. Absolutely. So I'm just going to put a line over here. When isn't 240 off to the left somewhere? Uh -huh. And here's my 240. That's an x value. Step two, we found the z-score. And there's a way to do this problem without finding the z-score, but I'll still find it. Yeah, it's our first problem today, so let's still find the z-score. The formula for z is x minus mu over sigma. I'll put that up here just so everyone knows. z equals x minus mu over sigma. Your, your data value minus your mean divided by the standard deviation. And we can calculate the z-score for 240. And so the, that's the x value. The mean was 266, 
and the standard deviation was 16. Now, if you do all this at once on a calculator, will you put parentheses around the top? <laughs> because of order of operations. Thanks. All right, let's see what we get. Negative 14? No, no, I'm sorry. Negative 26 over 16. What did it come out to on a calculator? Negative 13 over 4, uh, 13 over 8. Yeah, what's the decimal? Uh, one, negative 1.625. Negative 1.625. All right. So now it comes <coughs> to finding the actual percentage, the probability, all right, or the percentile rank. All these words mean the same thing. The probability, the percentile rank. If I said probability, the question would be, what's the probability that I randomly chose one woman who's pregnant and her gestation period lasts less than 240 days? What we always use with our TI-8384, this normal CDF button. We just use that right there. And in here we put our lower Z, our upper Z, the mean of Z, and the standard deviation of Z. This is what we did. Now these two numbers are always the same thing. You can look in that image I drew right here. What's always the mean of Z? Zero. Zero. What's the standard deviation of Z? One. One. So this is always zero and one. And you look at this image, you're like, well, what's the Z score right there? The X value is 240, but the Z score associated with that is a negative 1.625. You go, what does that really mean in real life for saying that? A woman with a gestation period of 240 days is 1.6 standard deviations below the mean. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Well, the mean was 266. So I get to put the lower Z is going to be, sometimes students make errors and they put the negative 1.625 here. That's not it. So when you look at this, lower, upper, lower's left, upper's right, you can use your hands. What's this? Z value way over here because it's shaded and this thing shades forever. I only shaded to here, but I mean you're shading what? To infinity. To infinity that way, which is a negative infinity, true? Mm -hmm. So what's my lower Z? Negative well, it's a negative infinity. The only thing is we don't have a negative infinity button, do we? So we use a drastically very high large negative number, which is negative 1 E99. E and then what's the upper number? <coughs> negative 1.625. Now, how do we do that on the calculator again? Let me do a negative 1, E, 99. And we'll go through it. Let's go through this again. How do I find that negative 1, E, 99? So when this is, I wanted to make sure we did at least a couple of these problems today before we get to the other sections. So I go in here, I'm like, OK. I go to the distribution menu which is second bars, I hit normal CDF, and I can put negative 1. To hit that E, everyone, that means times 10 to the 99 power, I have to hit second comma. Second then the comma, that little, that upper KC, it's not the lower KC. <laughs> and then I put 99. Then I put a comma, then I put negative 1.625, 0 comma 1. All right. Now, what are some acceptable answers? I could say that the percentile rank is, here's my final answer. I could say this. I am fine with that. Because what percentile is that? You can read it to me. What percentile? Five, 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 yeah. yeah. It's a fifth percentile. But this is an appropriate way to answer this question. We'll say fifth, and then we'll say percentile. So I'm going to write it like that. And yes, everyone, if it was 0.055, I accept fifth or sixth percentile. But if you just want to write that, that's fine too. So does that want to go with that? Awesome. Hey, uh, and another way this question would have been asked, what's the probability? <coughs>
by randomly chose, randomly chose, you know, pregnant woman from Anne Arundel Medical Center, that her gestation period is less than 240 days. We get that same answer, it'd be like 5% chance. It's probably almost, almost rare, right? Very close to being rare, 5%. We'll consider anything under 5% in this class unusual. Cool. All right, hey, so uh, let's do another one. Let's see with this one. I'm thinking, how about negative? <coughs> Excellent. Here's my next question. So what's the probability that a randomly chosen woman's women's gestation period? in two days. Okay. And we go through the motions, right? The first thing is I make a picture. 266 is in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. Where is 202 in the image? All the way to the left. It's over the left. Isn't it really far though? Yeah, we're like, well, it's over to the left, but I mean, it's really far off to the left. So this is going to be an interesting answer to our question, right? I mean, you'll agree, I'm, I'm not shading much, am I? I mean, it's way over here. I'm even shading too much. I just wanted to get some yellow chalk on the board. <laughs> you know, I'm shading to the left, but you know, and this thing is probably really far past here in terms of spell shape. A few standard deviations over here. This would be a wild z-score. Way past negative three, going to the left side. All right. Um, so, in, can you give an, do you have an idea of the answer to this question before we do all the math? Is this going to be a high probability? Nope. Excellent. So good, good. Yeah. Statistically literate. You're like, Shh. this is going to be a very, very low probability. This would happen. I mean, that's 202 days. You can calculate the months there. I mean, that is low, right? 30 days in a month, right? 30 times 8 is 240 days. You're like, my gosh. So we're going to get a low, low probability here. We're expecting that. Um, when we do this problem, I've got my 202 over here. I'm still shading to the left, right? Mm -hmm. Is everyone okay if this time I take the shortcut? Okay. I am going to bypass step 2 where you haven't calculated Z. I could have done that. And I'm going to do all this because I just think a lot of you will prefer to do this. And I can just do my lower x value, my upper x value, the mean of x, and the standard deviation of x. So is everyone okay with this? All we're doing here is we're saving time, right? We're saving a step. I'm saying I'm just going to skip over this. So by me marking a song, I'm saying I'm going to skip this step. Because so I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> I could do it. But I'm going to go right to here because I know what I'm expecting, but I'm going to let the technology do the work for me. Except now I'm going to do lower x, upper x, mean of x, standard deviation of x. So now, this is not zero anymore. What was the mean of the x's? 266. Yeah, that's right there, that 266. See that? So I'll put it out here. Standard deviation of the x's. You can go over and look. What was it? It has to be given to you. And you can definitely do this. Please feel free to do this. We're skipping a step in our process here. Look at this. We can still use for lower x. What's the lowest? Negative what? <coughs> 1099. But what's that x right there? 202. So let's type it in our calculators. 
we are expecting a very, very low, low probability. Maybe close to 0% chance. Because we're saying this would be very unlikely, right? Torque. So it's always 1E99? Yep, it's always at when these things are shaded either on the left tail or on the right tail. And so, Tori, if it's on the left tail, you're like, because we always do a lower and an upper. If it's shaded on this side, you're like, negative 1E99 for your negative infinity and then the number. If we shade over on that side, I'll just make a quick image. If we did like a greater than, you had something over here. I'll just make up a number like 270. And it went this way, like that. Mm -hmm. You're going to use 270 and then positive 1E99 for your value. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Outstanding. So, I'll go and hit it. Second distribution, normal CDF. I'm going to type this in. So I want you to see this number. All right. Negative 1 E99. That means negative 1 times 10 to the 99 power, right? Comma. 2 of 2. 2, 6, 6, 16. And we expect a really low number. Do you agree? So when I'm on my test, you see what's on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. Guess what Professor Messenger gets all the time on his tests? You ready? Final answer. This happens all the time. That's my answer. That's not right, is it? No. I mean, think about that answer. You're like, that. no, 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 no. 1.0 <laughs> is 100% chance. This is saying the odds are 300 point 316% chance. Do you agree? You're like, then it's impossible. What did I forget? It's very important. I'll hit the lights on way at the end. So let's see it. That what? E. E. Minus 5. And then negative 5. Now, if you want to write that as a decimal, absolutely. What's that as a decimal? 0 0.40. You can write it like this on a test. This is great. But he goes, write your way, Art. Feel free to put a decimal point, and then zero, 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 and then the, and that's good enough. You're saying, man, this is really, really close to 0% chance. Very unlikely. Very, very unlikely. You know? Possible. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's possible, but it's very unlikely. So that's what we're saying here. So I do want to point out, you're going to start getting answers like this all the time now. These ridiculously low probabilities. Yeah, because sometimes the question is, what's the chances Professor Messenger dies today? And we're like, oh, don't say that. You know, people get nervous when I say stuff. But, you know, could it happen? Well, yeah, it could, but the chances are usually what? Not very high, right? So that's what I want to point out. We're going to get a lot of answers. We, we scan the whole peripheral vision. Look down there. Yeah, and see if you see anything there. Cool. Hey, uh, my next problem, before we do seven point three is I'm going to do a problem with that inverse norm button. I just want you to everyone get an opportunity to use this inverse norm button. The inverse norm button, everyone, is useful in doing an opposite operation. Okay? So inverse norm, I'm going to put that down. If you put in here, everyone, the mean of z, the standard deviation of z. If you hit the percentage shaded from the left of the bell curve, the area, right, a proportion of 1 from the left side, you can get the z-score to come up on your calculator. All right? So in this question, this is what I'm going to ask. Um, what two gestation periods? What two gestation periods actually make up the middle 80% of the distribution? I'm just going to put a question mark. So this is going to be fun, everyone. I want to give everyone an opportunity to do these, this inverse normal. Notice this is like a total reverse question. Right? This is, everything's backwards right now. I'm giving you the percentage. 
So we start out, everyone, first step is we definitely draw a picture, don't we? But Ellen, would you shade 80% from the middle? Here, just go like this. Nice picture going on, right? 80% from the middle. You know what we're looking for? We're looking for that X value and that X value. Now, some of you can make guesses, right? Mm -hmm. Look, it's probably around the 240 mark, 250. It's probably around 290 or something. Yeah, it's probably it's in here. Those are the two answers we should get for dates. But to do this, we're going backwards. We're going for percentage. And you're like, oh, but I need this Z button. So step two are when I need to get Z, right? I need to compute the Z, and then I can get it. And then in my step three, everyone, once I get the Z score, I can go get the X values. So uh, what's the formula for Z? X minus mu. All right. Since there's two of them, I'm going to make two of these. Oh, they're there. I just want these two. But do you know what we're solving for? Well, once I get Z, we're going to get these answers. So I'll just take this part two off. You know, what are we solving for? We're trying to solve for what letter? X. So I'm going to highlight it. So you can make put this in there. You're like, this problem is just completely reversed of everything else we're doing. Because we're going backwards here. So I start out, I need to get the Z, I got to use that button right there. Mm -hmm. So now, look at this image. I have to enter into my calculator the percentage right there on that left tail. Because the way this calculator designed this button is percentage from the what? Left. left. So some of you just do this in your head. Ten. Everything's got to add to 100%. 80% here. What's 100% what's minus 80%? Divide by two. And you all just do this in your head, I love it. 100% minus 80% is 20%. So these two have to add up to 20%. You divide it by two and you get? 10%. 10%. So I'm going to enter 10% here. How do you write 10% as a decimal? 0 0.1. 0 0.1, good. What's the mean of Z? Zero? Okay. What's the standard deviation of Z? So let's go find these Z scores and I can put them right here and we can just solve for X. That's all. That's what we'll do. We go on here. This time I want to go back to that menu. Does everyone see inverse norm? Number three. Ooh. Okay, here I go. I'm putting 0.1 comma 0 comma 1. Now this should report to me not a probability, but a Z score. And the Z score is negative 1.28, right? All right. Okay. Let's see what we Right here, Z equals negative 1.28. Hey, look at my image. What do you think Z equals here? 1.28. <laughs> Symmetry, 1.28. Okay. So I've got a negative 1.28 equals this. I've got a 1.28. If you want to carry out the values further, you can. So the 1.28. One five five five. I just wrote this out because I could save some room on the board here, Autumn, but you could write all that out. But I have to solve for what letter? X. X. And this could be one of only two times in this whole class you and I are going to do some algebra. Because it looks like we're just going to do a little algebra. Nah. 266. Standard deviation was what? 16. Can you help me solve this? Sure. The multiple Even if you hate algebra, I think everyone in here can do this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the prerequisite to this course, it's like students should be able to solve a little equation like this. Of course you can. Multiply the one on both sides. 16. So I'm going to go, what's 16 times negative 1.28? Negative 20.48. And then I'm going to have to add the 266. 266 to both sides. So this answer here, everyone, should be x equals 16 multiplied to a negative 1.28, blah, 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 plus a 
266 days. And then this answer over here, what will this come out to be? Very similar, but it's going to be 1.28 times 16. Add it to the 266. So we get 16 times the 1.28. Plus 266. That one had a negative 1.28. This just had a positive 1. And these will be our two gestation periods associated with this. Now we know this. We should get answers like 240 and 280 or something, right? 245.52 and 286.48. Thank you so much. I mean, he's in it for you. I'll hit the lights. Same again, 240 what? 245.52. 245.52 for the lower? What was the upper? Uh, 286.40. Cool. If everyone wants to see this on a calculator, notice I saved this value here. I'm just going to go like this. Take my last answer, ants, multiply 16, and add 266. And there's that 248. Art said 248.5. Art, great. It was a great estimate, right? I just want to show if, oh, if I used every digit up there of all those values in the calculator, I didn't round anything. I really get 248.1, 248.7 for my lower, and then what would be the upper? I have to do right 1.628155, times what was that? 16, 16 yeah. and then I'm going to add the uh, 266. And I get that. And let me do this again. What was the z score? Second distribution. I'll do it again. Inverse norm. 0 0.1, comma, 0, comma, 1. And I multiply that to the uh, 16. 16. And added 266. And uh, I apologize that when I saw that my typed it on the calculator, I had a accidentally had a little negative there. That's the lower. I apologize. So Art, you were right. 245 point five two. Yeah. And I'm gonna put four nine or just point five. And that would be the lower. And the higher value, everyone, I'm just going to do the same thing, but multiply a minus one. Yeah. So it's second distribution, inverse norm, 0.1 comma 0 comma 1. But that's negative, but I want to use the positive, right? So if I just say negative ants, and add a positive. So I'll take a positive 1.28, multiply the 200 and, no, the multiply the 16 and add the 266. And I get what? 286.5. 286.5. And now I'm going to draw this in a picture. This is the answer. So I'll kill these lights on with the light. Here's my answer to this question. Right here. What are these two gestation periods that made up this middle 80 percent. And I never rounded until the end, did I? And I just rounded to one decimal place. 245.5 days is the lower. And what's the upper? 286.5 days. And you can even draw a picture with this. When I'll take out this math here, you can draw a picture and go, that's what's going on. 80 percent here, and right here, pss, right here, pss, you get this 245.5 days, and you got this 286.5. Isn't that cool? So, so we can actually do it in an inverse operation to find out the actual x values. So you're not going to round it to the next day? That's right. If you want, you can, though. Okay. I like it, everyone. He goes, you can make this 246 and 287. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I did 0.5s, but if you want to get the next day, you're like, hey, 246 days. And round up, this would be what? 287. 
I love it. Can I make that up? <coughs> cool. Hey, uh, which part was annoying out of that problem? All the what? Oh, come on, admit it. The algebra, right? Who wants to do all that algebra? So, this button, I know I put z's here, right? Couldn't I just put in the what? The x's? Shouldn't that work? If I did inverse norm and then mean of what? Mean fx. Standard deviation of x. What should it do for me? It should give me the x value on the image. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. So when watch this. If you're like, can I bypass all that boring algebra? Of course you can. So you're like, can I do this? Can I put the percentage and then put mean x, standard deviation x, and then it'll just report to me the what? Yes, you bet. So when here's the image. Look, 10% shaded from the left. Hello, calculator. Can you just tell me the x value right here? Yeah, that's all I have to do. What's the mean of x? 266. 266. What's this? 16. So you know me. I like to always show you the long way. Mm -hmm. But if some of you like, like, oh, can I just do this? Sure. I'm going to bypass it. And what comes up on your calculator? Try it. Inverse, no, I'm just going to this. You don't have to do all that z work. And it'll be perfect, right? You're like, oh, thank you. 245.9, right? 4.9. Four, four nine. Four nine. Just like we got before. Is that okay then? Isn't that way better? I know, you know me. I like to share the long way first off, and then you're like, hey, can I just do this? Yeah, now, help me out. Who knows what we should enter on our calculator for the percentage to get to here? Look how far you're going to go. 90. 90%. Someone got that? So. Go back to your calculators, hit this, hit 90%. That should put you, look, 10% plus the 80% all the way at the 90%. That should report to you that actually. So try that. Inverse norm 0 0.9, 266, 16. What's it give you? 266.5. Isn't that cool? Another way you can do it is like subtract from 266 to 45 and add it. Yeah! <laughs> Different. So I wanted to show you this. So you're like, oh, okay, man, this is way easier. I didn't have to do all that algebra. I, I don't like algebra. Oh, there you go, technology. What's important is we understand what we're looking for. Cool? Cool. All right. Hey, uh, assessing normality. We'll spend the, the majority of the rest of the class actually in 7 4, but. I'm briefly going to talk about this assess and normality. Let me get this out of the way. When we assess normality with what's called normal probability plots, we assess normality with what's called a normal probability plot. And a normal probability plot is a plot of the observed values. Those are the actual data values versus the normal scores. And I'm going to put in parentheses the expected z scores. Okay. And a little formula to do this. So this is what. And we won't spend much time in section 7.2. That's fine. I'll explain why. But we still will cover this. And if I was doing a normal probability plot, and you find this stuff, everyone, in section 8, around page 383, you would have to fill out if you did this thing by hand. I just want to show you what you'd have to do. You have index. You have an observed value. This would be by hand. You find this 
take on f sub i, which is equal to i minus 0.375 divided by n plus 0.25. I is the index, and n is just going to be the number of observations. All right? So I just want to make a note that at I in there, I equals the index that you'd have in this column, and your index would be something like, you know, index 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So you'd put down the index value, which is I. The observed value, you know, like, like what? Like they were gestation periods. It was like, oh, hers lasted 250 days. Then you put 250 there. And hers lasted 270 days. You put your 270 there. These would be the observed values. But then you can calculate this. I want to point out N is the number of observations you have. Alright. But again, you're you heard me say, you're like, you're not going to spend much time on this section. It looks like a lot of math. Because we'll talk about the technology and how useful it can be. Um, but after you do all this, you get these values in your columns, and then you get what's called your expected z score from this. And the way you get your expected z for score, everyone. I'll give an example of these problems. Let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's say my observed value is 245. I'm trying to think of the last answer we got. 245 point, what was it? The oh, lower right. end. Is that right, Angela? 245.5. Let's pretend I had a, someone had a 245.5 days for gestation period or 200. 46, and you did all this math, and there were a bunch of observations. But everyone, how can I get the expected z score for that? Right? Let's just say this math right here came out to be a 0.1. Now, when I'm bypassing this, because to do all this math, I need to know what? M would be the total number of observations. I would be the index value, right? N is 7 here, right? Right, in this case, M would equal 7. Uh -huh. And we'd have 7 observations. I would be the what? 1. 1. And you do all this math, and you get this value here, right? But here you've got to get the expected Z score. I want, you to, I want you to show, well, how the heck would I get that? To do this, you would have to hit that inverse norm button of this value. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. So, I mean, what would come out of this? The resulting value here comes out of this little math formula. And uh, it depends on how many values you got, right? I do want to point out when you write down your observed values, they always want you to write them so that they're in the ascending order. So from the lowest to the highest. So if you had a group of data, let's say 20 data values, you put the lowest here and the highest up there. And then you do all this, then you get these expected z-scores. But I do want to point out, if you did get a value like 0.1 here, let's say, after we did all this math, you put your 1 in here, you subtract this. Let's say n was a 7. You do all that math, you get a value there. But to get the expected z-score, I'd have to hit that inverse what? Norm button. Do you follow me? Because that's representing 10% from the left. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So now, you get that, and you get these expected z-scores. Anyways, I think you all are noticing. Doing it by hand, not too bad, but isn't it time consuming? Yeah. This is what I want you to observe. Wouldn't that take a while? So there is software out there that can produce the normal probability plots for us. So I'm going to hit the lights. You can look at these. I'm going to hit the lights. You can look at these. These are some examples of some normal probability plots. But these were produced with something called Minitab. Minitab, everyone, is an outstanding software. Outstanding software. But, uh, it does cost some money, so I didn't require everyone in this class to use Minitab. Although, hey, you might go take another stats course at another college, 
and it might be a requirement. You might go to Towson, they might be like, oh, to take this course, you need Minitab. Or some of you may finish your degree here, you have your bachelor's degree, and then you get your, oh, I gotta get my master's degree and take a stats course. They might say, you're required Minitab in this course. But the Minitab can produce these normal probability plots. Now, when the question that's being asked here is, Determine whether the normal probability plot indicates the sample data could have come from a population that's normally distributed. The answer, and we'll keep this simple, the answer is going to be yes. If all these red dots, so there's red dots, I'm colorblind. If all these red dots are in the curves, but if you get one dot outside the curve, we're going to say no. So uh, how about in this image? There's one dot all the way to the right. Would we say yes or no? You know, determine whether the normal probability plot indicates that a sample data could have come from a population that's normally distributed. Yes or no? We're going to say no, because we see what? That red dot right there, right? Cool. Now, in this case, in this problem, what could we say? Yes. Yes. Excellent. So All right. Do they always have to have these three lines, like there are three lines? Yeah, and those curves were produced by the what? The Minitab software. Okay. And for, because of that, everyone, because our TIE feed, this thing's an outstanding calculator, it does not produce those nice little curves there, Art. That's why for me, in terms of my tests, I will not require anybody to do all that by hand and stuff like that. But what I could do is on a test is take one of these images, and I could ask you what? I could give an image like this and say, hey, this was produced with mini plot. Excuse me, with mini tests. I could do that, and I could ask you, determine whether the normal probability plot indicates the sample data could have come from a population that normally distributed, right? What would you say, Holland, in this case? No. no. Does that make sense? And that's important. So I do, right? You go, we could do this, couldn't we? If anybody wanted to practice this, you can. And there's a good write-up on this on page 33, but without the technology to produce this, it's very, very what? It's not hard, it's just it's time consuming, it's tedious, true? I mean, you can even use a spreadsheet, but we'd have to produce those curves. So and that's why I wanted to say I wasn't going to spend much time in that, Holland, because of course we can do that, but software like this really, really facilitates this. We don't have that software. So what I would do, everyone, just to wrap things up, I would produce that for you with Minitab, and then I could ask that question, right? Has everyone got it? What would you say again here? Yes or no? No. No. How about here? Yes. Yes, and then here? No. You got it? You got it? That's my point. Now, if you want to do you like, no, I want to do this by hand. Absolutely. No. Get all she's like, no, all of goes no. You get all your, you know, how many what are all my indices? How many do I have? Then I can start doing this. I'm with you. Yeah, we want to use the technology. It's just we don't have that here. Cool. Hey, great job. Hey, uh, the remainder of class. We're gonna spend it in section seven point four. Have you seen my title on the board? Do you see it? Oh, good. Preston? You know, that's a good question. You could use a table. I'll be honest. So if I didn't use that calculator, I could do all that math right there, Preston, by hand. Let's say n equals 7. And in this case, for this value, i was a 1. I could do all that math. But then when I got the here, I'd be like, how can I get the expected z-score? The back of your book has a card with a bunch of tables on it. You could, if you say, I don't want to use a calculator, you could read the z-score oh. off that table. You would match it up with whatever and then came out here. Okay. Right there, I'm sorry, right there. You look, all right, what's the z-score associated with point 0.1? Cool. All right. Everyone, great job with this. I'll erase all this. Thanks, that's what I was saying. Everyone, if you're like, boy, I did not want to spend too much time on that section just because, of course we could, there's so many other great, great things we can talk about, especially like in section 7.4, the binomial probability distributions. Uh, Ellen, do you remember binomial? Mm -hmm. So polynomial. Like I remember this. Can we talk about this? How many outcomes were possible? Two. Two. Success and failure. failure. And there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of circumstances, events in this world that occur such that we do have binomial probability distributions. Live, die. We talked about on time, not on time. 
right? I think the problem in the test was smoke before 18, smoke after 18, <laughs> hit the basket, miss the basket, <laughs> binomial. But when are binomial distributions bell shaped? Yep. Are they approximately normal? Uh -huh. They truly are as long as n times p times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. All right? So I'm just going to make up some numbers here, all right? Here's my first example. Let's say, everyone, how about I'm thinking of like righties and lefties? Now, when the probability that someone's lefty is, that's like a 13% chance. So that's given to you. Uh, let's just say I look at uh, 30 students. 30 students, okay? Those are called trials. Um, is this distribution approximately normal? That's my question. And when is this binomial probability distribution approximately normal? Yes or no? Well, all we do is check n times p times 1 minus p. And we do these, we calculate it. If the number's 10 or higher, we say yes. And Holland's giving me a no. <laughs> I'm going to try this on your count. That's a 30. What goes here? 0.13. 0.13. Uh, some of you just do this in your head. What's 1 minus 0.3? 0.87. Uh, now, you can type 1 minus 0.13 on your calculator. I just thought I'd write like this. We're going to multiply these. Very simple. If we get a number 10 or higher, we'll say yes. If it's lower than 10, we're saying no. So sometimes the sample size is so small, and the probability is so small, it's maybe still skewed. And it's not really bell-shaped. It might look like this. I mean, it might be all skewed like that, or it might be, in this case, really low percent skewed like that. And that's what's going on. Cool. Um, what do you all get? 3.393. Way lower. Way, way low. 3.3. Everyone, no. <laughs> no. Oh, so you can use this to see what could be a perfect sample size. Exactly. And you're, it's like, who came up with the number 10? You know, after all these, oh. all these experiments and stuff, they figured 10 was a pretty decent number for this. Okay. Hey, if you want to say this easier, and when 1 minus p, isn't that just a compliment? You know, like, let's say there's a 30% chance of rain today. What's 1 minus p? <laughs> What's 1 minus 30%? Or excuse me, 1 minus 0 0.3. 0 0.7, right? I think we should come up with a letter for the class for that. So how about from this day forward, from this day forward, how about in our class, let's let the, what's the letter after P in the alphabet? Q. Q. <laughs> let's let Q, for our class, just always be 1 minus P. The only reason I'm saying that is because you might find this easier to set. See all that right there? It's an easy way to remember this. Then what would this formula be? N, P, Q. So you can just say, I'll just remember that N, P, Q must be greater than or equal to 10. How about that? It just becomes that, you know, we do things like this when we're studying, practicing it. It's an easy way to remember. N, P, Q, greater equal to 10. N, P, Q. Q represents the what? 1 minus P. Now, and don't be shocked if for the next six weeks straight, I get to ask that class question every day. I'll never get mad. Students go, what's Q again? I'll always say it, 1 minus P. So it'll come on, you'll laugh. Students always ask me, because it's not in the book, right? So students will be like, where's this Q coming from? <laughs> you know, a lot of other textbooks do the same thing. That's why I'm doing it. A lot of other textbooks use that Q for one minus two. If it is 89 students, then it will be more than 10. Oh, I like this. So in my case, all right, I'm going to use a number a little bit higher than that. What if this was 100 students? Yep, we do. So I went in a gigantic lecture hall, and there's 100 students there. And I want to know about this binomial probability distribution, whether that's approximately normal. Would that be basically bullshit? So we do n times p times, well, I call it q. <laughs> and we see if this is greater than equal to 10, and I'll put a question mark. Yes or no? And that's n times p times that q means 1 minus p. And you get your 
100 multiplied to a 0.13 multiplied to a 0.87. That's how we're getting at 1 minus p. We're just subtracting that. How big is that? Ooh, 11-ish? 11 11.31. 11 11.3, the answer is what? Yes. Yes. Cool. I do want to point out for the remainder of class, so when, we need, when we answer these binomial problems, please, can we use the binomial method? I'll say it again. Please, let's all use the binomial method. And you go, why? Why don't you want to do the normal method and use this? Because it would all be approximate answers. Remember with this, you're talking about a discrete variable. Do you remember what discrete variable meant? Mm -hmm. Countable? And so if you're using a bell shape, which deals with the continuous variables, we're just going to be able to approximate the answer. It wouldn't be good enough. It'll be close. Plus, it takes more math. Aren't we now, it's the year 2016, we have these awesome binomial buttons on this calculator, which give the exact answer. So when we do these problems, let's all use the what? The binomial problems. So on that note, you go, well, if I wanted to approximate it, I want to have fun with that, you'd have to look at, if anybody's got, oh, you got your textbook there, it's here. I mean, look at page, I just wanted to look at this. Look at page 390. You would have to memorize that. <laughs> Sarah, that's what you'd have to do. If you wanted to use the approximate normal technique for these binomial distributions here, we would have to memorize that. And then the answers wouldn't be exact. Do you follow me? So it's a, when you know what the word obsolete means, right? Mm -hmm. This whole technique has become obsolete because we now have good technology. Do you follow me? Advanced technology with binomial buttons that you can just go boom, 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 gets exact answers. So on that note, I know everyone in here practices the problems on the textbook. The first thing is, I'm going to give you the good textbook problem from our practice. For you to, to work at home. It's number 21. This is for practice. And yes, and when I already have this on your practice sheet. This is on page 392. This is for your homework. This is in section 7.4. But what I'm going to do is, I want to write down all the answers if you use the binomial button, OK? So would you write these down? These are just for you to check. That's the answer letter A. You should get about 0.928 for letter B. A 0.003 for letter C and letter D. 0.536. And just put them in your notes and say, I will check these. Check. That's for you to check after you do your problems. And I want you to use which method? Binomial. Program. Yeah, so use the binomial method. What I mean by binomial method, I want you to use the binomial probability. I think you all follow me. And when it's like I'm an English teacher and I need you all to write a paper. I, this is an analogy. It's like me saying, everyone, you've got to write your paper with a typewriter. Has anybody ever seen a typewriter? Have you seen them? You know, uh, I might be the only one in the room who grew up with them, maybe. All right, Jim, you said. Oh, yeah, and everyone's like, ching. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's very, very tedious and stuff like that, right? With the typewriter. Now we have, you know, computers. We've got these Microsoft Word. Type that stuff up. We find. So I check these because the answers in the back of the book are going to be a little bit off. Well, the answers in the back of the book. Guess which technique they used? Pit that page, what page was that? <laughs> Where they approximated. So Art, that's why I need us to put these down. Uh -huh. Because the answers in the back of the book use the approximate normal technique. And they're going to be a little bit off. They didn't, they didn't do it with the binomial buttons. These are with the binomial buttons. And the whole idea of this autumn, you're with me, these are exact answers. And, these are, and it's easier to do it this way with our technology. So we're not using that obsolete technique. You follow me? Oh, good. And for practice, Ellen, we're just going to do a couple of these. Sound good? I want us to do an exactly. Remember this before? All right, we're going to do an exactly. Let's do one with, um, let's definitely do one with at least. Remember at least? And then we'll finish up with between. Can I ask you a question? Sure. This binomial doesn't have anything to do with the Pascal's triangle binomial, does it? No, it doesn't. It but doesn't. In a, that's because that's two things, right? But it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, you know about Pascal's drawing. Oh, yeah. 
All right, everyone. So for our last problem, I'm going to take a problem. I actually got this out of the earlier edition because when you had the uh, what the fourth edition, this is from his third edition. So this is the question I'm going to put on the board. I just found the topic interesting to me. It's called murder by firearms. All right. So this is titled murder by firearms. All right. Murder by firearms. And uh, this is what they did. They took, they looked at 50 murders randomly. So they already occurred, <laughs> but they randomly chose 50 murders. They already had happened. All right. So, and that's your number of trials, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right. And they wanted to see, here's the question that we're looking at. We want to see if these, these murders were committed with the firearm or not committed with the firearm. Is that binary? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were these murders committed with the firearm or not a firearm? Binomial experiment, right? Binomial distribution. So we're going to look at random, 50 random mur murders. Uh, now, the probability is 67.8%. Point 0.678. 67.8% Everyone of uh, murders are already committed with the firearm. Where's that number coming from? That's from like a crime report. Someone's been already doing statistics on this, right? That's given to us, that's something that's given for the population, roughly 67.8% of murders are committed with the firearm. I'm going to look at 50 random murders. It could be in the state of Maryland. Well, letter A, here's my first question. Is the binomial distribution Approximate normal. That's my first question. Right. Is the binomial distribution approximately normal? I want to abbreviate. You can do the same thing. Is the binomial distribution approximately normal? What do we check? NPQ. NPQ. How high has it got to be? What can? You go, oh, do we have enough information here? Yep. I give you the N, I give you the P. Q. One minus P. All right, I want N times P times Q. 50. 0.678. And I'll let you do it on a calculator. What, what's 1 minus 0.678 on a point calculator? 0.322. 0.322. Two. And we just want to say, see if this number is greater than 10. If this is greater than 10, we're going to say yes, right? This is Y. We're going to go Y. Yes or no? Why? Here's our reason. 10.9. The answer? Yes. yes. It would be Bell Street. I just want to put that out there. Now we've got to answer some questions. Now in the textbook, <laughs> you would have an option. But we're going to use which method? Let's use the binomial method. So here's my first question, right? The word exactly. Approximate the probability that exactly 40 murders committed with fire. All right, so what's the probability exactly 40 out of 50 were committed with the fire? I didn't put all the words, but the question is what's the probability exactly 40 out of 50 of the murders that I randomly chose were committed with the fire? Where this is what the going rate or chance of someone being murdered with a fire or miss. How do we do that in the calculator? I know um, PDF, right? Mm -hmm. You put the N here, you put the P here, and you put the X here. So this was 50, this was what? 0.678, what was this? That's got to be the successes, right? Yeah. Sounds weird though, doesn't it? Success, murder, I know. The number of successes is what? 40. Holland has the newer calculator. It goes vertically. And she types this in. They call this the number of trials. Number of successes, the P. And when did you hit binome P? Not normal. Right? We're jumping from the normal back to binomial. What do you get? 0 0.022. 0 0.022? Is that okay, man? Let her see. I want to have out at least. 
to the SQ. At least 35 merge. That's out of the 50. Committed with the firearm. Do you remember how to do this with the 1 minus? Mm -hmm. I wanted to do this. I'm going to do calculator. 1 minus binome, not P, but C. C. CDF, the binome CDF, I'm going to accumulate all the way up to 34. To 34. 34. Thanks, Art. And when, you know what I'm doing? I'm subtracting out 0 to 34. So I'm left with the 35 and higher. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'll do it too. Then we'll do a few in between when we'll be done. Binome CDF 50, comma, 0.678, comma, 30. Oh, not 5, but 34. Remove 0 to 34, I'm left with about 0 0.435. All right. And here comes D and E. D, what's the probability? That fewer than 125, or excuse me, that's the problem in the book. Fewer than 25 murders. How would you do that? Just binome CD it, right? Yep. I wonder if it's just fewer than, you just do binome CDF 50, comma, 0.678. This is for fewer than. So you're just doing less than, you don't need one minus. You're just going to accumulate all the way up to, fewer than doesn't include the end point though. So I'm going to go all the way up to 20, what's one less than 25? 24. And the reason I'm doing that, I want to is because the wording fewer than, is doesn't mean less than or equal to, it just means less than. Fewer than means less than. So I'll let you all do that one. And then we'll end with the knee. Do between. Let me know what you get on that, though. And then the last one will be a between. Interesting. I just go get a random sample of all these murders that already occurred, randomly chosen. The chance is that 25 out of 50 of them, all right, or fewer, were committed with firearms. You know, and you say, like, how did they, how were they murdered? I don't know, pushed out a window, drowned, you know, all these things, choking. The chances would be really, really, really small. So it's that most murders are committed with what? Firearms. Firearms, okay. And then letter E, probability between 30 and 35. Okay, how do we do that? Well, I'm not using the 1 minus, but I'm going to use the cum button. Mm -hmm. Binome, CDF, that means cumulative. Mm -hmm. Let's go up to the 35. Yep. All right. 0.678, 35. So I start out, everyone, what did I just do? It took cumulative all of them to 35. I, all, I did 0 to 35. But I only want between 30 and 35. So I have to subtract out. Michael, good. Subtract out the 29. Good. And what do I want to remove? Because I got this is 0 to 35, right? This is 0 through 35. I want to remove from the 0 to 35 the 0 through. 29, these, right, it's a discrete variable, all those probabilities, and you'll be left with your answer. So what's, 
binome CDF this, minus binome CDF this. And as long as we get two people to get the same answer, I'll put it on the board. We're done. What do you all get? 0.5874. Do we have a second on that? Mm -hmm. I'll wait. We're just going to see if anyone else gets it. That's two. That's right. Good job. Hey, everyone. Super job. Now, just so you know, as you're packing up, hope you have a great weekend. Uh, celebrate Easter. Happy, happy Easter. I do want to point out, remember, with our schedule, because of the two days we lost, the test isn't like next Tuesday. The test is April 5th. It's a week out. Does that sound good? So we go home another week. We just do two more sections, though. It's all normal CDF stuff. Have a great weekend.